Well, good morning to both of you. It's great to uh, great to have you here. Good morning. All right, <laughs> enjoying yourself so far, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. Let's get right to it. Two of the platforms that both of you are so integrally part of, founders of, in 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 so many ways, um, blockchain and um, AI, in individually have such a significant impact on the future, how we think about things, how we are changing our own lives. But Ben, let me start with you. Uh, how do you view um, AI actually benefiting blockchain? And then Talik, I'm gonna have the same question for you. Benefiting blockchain or benefiting from blockchain? Benefiting so from blockchain. So, oh yeah, because I mean, there, there, there are both directions. Yeah. I, I would say, I'm really more of an AI guy. I've been doing AI since the 1980s and, and all the way back to the late 90s, I, I was you know, daydreaming and then theorizing about how would you make a decentralized network of, of AIs, just a, a multi-agent system spanning the globe with AIs communicating and collaborating with other AIs which didn't need any, any central controller. And Marvin Minsky, one of the pioneers of the AI field, had the idea of a society of minds, where he envisioned intelligence emerging as a sort of collective dynamic among many different AIs cooperating together in a way w that the intelligence in the whole would exceed the sum of the intelligences of the parts. In the late 90s, it was easy to imagine how to do this, and we had distributed computing. We had cryptography, too, but, but all the pieces weren't really put together and it was a, a pain to try to implement something like that. So I'd sort of set that aside and worked on other aspects of general intelligence research and applied AI. And then when, you know, the, the breakthrough in my mind was seeing Ethereum blockchain, the Solidity scripting language, I mean, the work of this guy and, and his colleagues, it became clear for the first time you had a software platform that would make it not extremely painful to create a sort of decentralized society of minds and the real role there is in it's in coordination and governance I think like you don't at this point in time you don't want to have like a, a neural network where each time a neuron fires that goes on a blockchain you could do that but it's very very slow we right? will we will dive so, further into sort of the, but, the yeah. logistics of it and right. so for Luddites like me that can actually understand what it is that the hell you're <laughs> talking about uh, the, yeah. Vitalik, I want to put the same question to you. Yeah, I mean, AI and blockchains are definitely kind of very different things because like, an AI is a kind of agent, whereas a blockchain is a tool for, and really a tool for creating tools for mechanisms that agents use to interact with each other. And like so far, most of the applications that people have been building have been generally been focusing on uh, thinking of those agents as being people. So I use a cryptocurrency to buy a coffee from you. I put uh, some data about a product I'm selling to you on a blockchain. We use some DAO to, um, to raise money for something or engage in some f financial transaction, store information about some I identity, whatever. But there's no reason why these Apple, these same platforms can't also have AIs plugging in as being participants of them as well. And I think I mean, blockchains are in many ways even ideal for AIs participating in them because of just how fundamentally you know, programmatic they are, uh, they are at the base layer. Like it's easier for an AI to kind of really autonomously kind of own and control like crypto coins than it, than it is for it to have a credit card. And that's, so I, and I, I definitely see a lot of uh, natural opportunities for AIs participating in these systems because many of them are essentially creating markets and we've had AIs participating in markets for decades. Many of them are creating other kinds of systems that take input from a lot of different sources and there's definitely cases where AIs can just provide feedback and, and participate in, in, in these things on a 24-7 schedule much more quickly, in some cases uh, providing much more high quality input. So I think it's definitely something that's going to happen and it's p even going to happen without people necessarily explicitly planning for it to happen. Let's start a dive into sort of the specifics of what it is that you, for example, Ben, are working on on, on the technology, on, on the AI side. Uh, there is a need, obviously, to, for, for some semblance of governance. There's a need for some accountability mechanism. In order for the average person 
to really understand what's going on because I don't think that the average person does. But for, for them to um, have an understanding of what the impact is on their life, give me an, can you give me an example of sort of practical applications for a day-to-day -day life using um, AI? Sure, and I think the average person understanding how something works is one thing, and not many people understand how these devices they carry in, the, in their pockets work very well. So, that, But there's an interface that makes it really to interact with this device without understanding and it's everything us. that's happening in, 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 inside, right? So I, I, I think similarly, AI is already transforming people's lives in ways they don't realize, and that's gonna happen, happen more and more, and people aren't going to understand most of what's happening behind the, scene, the scenes as, 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 the, as they don't know. I mean, if you, if you look at it right now, we have you know virtual assistants like Google Assistant or Siri, which are really not very intelligent and not necessarily all, all that useful. But I think we're going to see things like that that actually work c coming out within the next, say, three to eight years or something that actually understand have, have memory on different time scales, understand a bit about what you've already done and what your interests are, understand the context in which they're operating. But then that, at, at, at the same time, we have AI rolling out through Internet of Things, so we're going to be in, in smart buildings, smart cities, smart cars, and so forth. So, I mean, the, the future is, is going to be one in which our environments in which we're interacting are predictive and are, are analytical and are recognizing patterns in what we do and responding accordingly. And this will have a huge number of implications, right? I mean, some are, are obvious to people now, like autonomous vehicles, which are considered obvious, though 10 years ago everyone told me it would, it would, it would never happen, right? And, and some, some, are, some are less obvious, like my, my oldest son is doing his PhD in AI applied to mathematical theorem proofing, right? So if AI can master math, I mean, that doesn't mean that much to the average person, but I mean, math is the core of, of almost everything we do, and th that, that's going to accelerate discovery across all aspects of engineering and science, which will have endless implications, like, like maybe nanotech batteries for these things that will mean they'll, they'll, they'll be able to run doing stuff and doing virtual reality and chips you can put in your brain. So I mean, AI is going to be on the back end of everything. The, the real worry and what had led me to be so interested in the intersection of decentralization and AI, the real worry is if this pervasive AI, which is upgrading every aspect of people's lives, is controlled by a handful of governments or, or a dozen large corporations. And that, that's where the decentralized control comes comes in okay. which, which is what blockchain can be and so, so valuable and for that's where you want to jump in on this vitalik is talking about that aspect of how blockchain does sort of add to that accountability layer yeah uh, so blockchains are de definitely really interesting in that they create this framework that makes it very easy for uh, groups of people and especially groups of people without kind of existing strong central trust anchors to make these institutions kind of arrangements for people to interact with each other and uh, just immediately start u using them right so there's and I've mentioned these d different examples around things like markets, some of these like, decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, start, a lot of people are interested in looking into things like rewarding content publishing. And so and, like, these are still all in a very early stage experiments, right? And like, if they're going to be as successful as we hope, then we'll expect them to and have become bigger and more interesting and uh, kind of more complete over time. And like really the ultimate uh, kind of goal of all this, right, is to just allow the 7.6 billion people of the world to communicate and interact with each other and benefit from the, uh, all of the wonderful benefits of having one civilization without needing to have these kind of central choke points be, contr be controlling the whole thing. So I think, but this is where the challenge comes in, is mm -hmm. because we've heard 
all, for, I'd say for the last perhaps five to seven years that there are data breaches, our information is being sold, and that suddenly we are giving up so much of our own pri uh, individual privacy, even though if you own a Facebook account, you should have known that you are literally giving away so much of your own data. But who owns the data? Who, who owns that aspect of our privacy? In the city of Toronto right now, we're having a conversation with uh, whether or not we should develop a certain part of our waterfront mm -hmm. um, for a smart city, it's sidewalk labs. Um, governments are balking at this because there's significant issues with respect to privacy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are some very legitimate concerns. Mm -hmm. When we hear from the two of you about um, you know, the chips and the upgrades and all of these things, these are all very fascinating things because we want this all to make our lives easier and smarter and simpler to give us more time for other things, which is what technology is supposed to do for us, right? How then do, well, I mean, I suppose it, when Ben's shaking yeah. his head, maybe it's not actually. Well, I mean, Stone Age people probably had more free time than the, yeah. the, 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 they were the busy leaving. developing uh, the free, free time is not the top level goal of humanity or we, we'd be in a quite different situation is there ethical yeah. issues behind this and with respect to well, privacy I mean who the, governs that there there's a whole huge range of ethical issues relating to privacy and there's great cultural variation in China and Africa it's a little different than here but yeah I, I, I would say one one big issue is you know the the utility of what large companies are doing with AI and our data is 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 very great, right? So, I mean, unless we can create things which have equal or greater utility in a way that respects agency and 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 privacy, people don't actually care enough about privacy not to use the the services big companies are offering. So, to give one simple example, like I I use Google News all the time. Mm -hmm. At one point, I got annoyed. And I disabled the personalization there, and then I'm like, "Why am I getting all this garbage news? I don't, I don't care about. The world has become very boring all of a sudden, right? So you, I, once I you re-enable the personalization, you know, then I get news about AI, about blockchain, about you know, Buckethead or mu musicians yeah. I like, <laughs> countries I may want to travel to. But the, the problem is that model of my interests is opaque to me. And it's stored within, you know, the the mind of some massive proprietary brain that Google is building, and probably sharing with the the NSA to spook to to spy on my friends or something, right? And so that the service should be offered. But they're the they're watching the live stream right now, actually. Oh, I'm sure they're watching. <laughs> uh, I'm sure they're watching many of us in this room all the time. Oh dear. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I. I uh, uh, it only we, took 13 minutes to get to that point. Yeah, we, 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 can say, we can say hi to the Chinese and Russian Secret Service. Hi, Vladimir. Right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ji. Hey, Vladimir. Well, that's, that's you know, it's, it's, I, you say it facetiously, but that's part of the issue mm. with the, the Huawei mm -hmm. um, platform. You know, this, we always kind of joke that, okay, don't spy on me. But well, who built the are. Great Firewall of China? Cisco built it originally, right? So, I, I mean, the, the Ch China is doing surveillance. U.S. is doing surveillance. E everyone's everyone's doing, doing surveillance. And there's not much evidence any great power is so much holier than, than, than the other ones. I mean, what, what, you, what you need is the, obviously the infrastructure of AI and big data management to be more like... Uh, mm. More like uh, Ethereum, BitTorrent, or, or Pirate Bay, you know. We, yeah, we, we, on the peer-to-peer -peer side. We, we need it to be on the peer-to-peer -peer side, and, and we, we, need, uh, we need people to have the mm -hmm. control and agency over their own data and transparency in, into how it's being used. And, of course, blockchain mm -hmm. itself doesn't achieve that, yeah. but it's a tool that is part of how you achieve that. Yeah, so the good news is that there's definitely no law of information theory that says that in order to get the benefits of evaluating some function on a huge, uh, on a huge piece of data, that data needs to all be in one place in a way that's accessible to, to big, powerful, centralized powers that be to evaluate whatever other functions they want on it. So. And there's been a lot of really interesting work in uh, cryptography the last uh, couple of decades on trying to make these more kind of decentralized machine learning protocols where you can like, learn and execute models on pieces of data without that data ever actually leaving the person's computer in an unencrypted form. And that's something that there's been a lot of projects around in the last couple of years. There's um, uh, even a lot of blockchain tie-ins yeah. here because there's uh, 
at least a couple of projects I know about that are trying to make these kind of blockchain mediated data markets where mm -hmm. basically on the app you would hold the data and then you would automatically you know, just um, participate in these uh, in these markets where you would let them run some computation and in exchange you would automatically get some uh, some kind of payment and that, that would just ensure that you can get the benefits of things like personalized news feeds and even get the benefit get the social benefits of your information being part of the thing that th that helps train these algorithms for everyone without your individual information actually kind of leaving your own machine right and that's so this is something that's becoming more um, and more in, uh, possible technologically. Um, on a political uh, front, I recently um, wrote this article. It's right at the top of my uh, blog, Vitalik.ca, um, called Control as Liability. And the thesis I made there is that while uh, 10 years ago, the uh, having more data of your your users is basically a pure benefit because like, hey, you know, why not? Why not just grab all that I can? It's just more things that I might be able to run some math on in the future. But now with uh, things, regulations coming in, data localization laws, privacy laws, um, regulatory agency is trying to kind of define the um, idea of uh, basically regulating central controllers and trying to define it, like what exactly is a central controller versus what is a software provider. It's actually creating a lot of incentives to build applications in ways that do minimize your uh, the application developer's ability to kind of see everything that's going on, right? So whereas if all of the data is actually being uploaded to a server in Silicon Valley, then or, you, know, you, you get like all of the political consequences that come with that. But if you're just building a piece of software where all of the data stays on the local machine and you're just building the thing that these local machines use to interact with each other, then it's much simpler for you, right? So it defi like, there definitely is a kind of both technical and economic opportunity to build things that work differently than the way things have worked the last decade. But you need the data, you need the information, you well, need, you like need how, th that's sort of the oxygen for these. Sure, these well, you need the data, but you do not need the data in a form which is decrypted in a way that you can actually see it and use it for all of, for all of these other like, more nefarious purposes or get hacked. So. Let me um, pivot that then, um, Ben, to you um, within the applying bl blockchain and, and in the AI. So what are the biggest challenges that you're facing right now as this sort of is a, an emerging area? Well, the challenges of applying blockchain in AI, I, I, guess, I guess there's technical challenges and, the, and then there's sort of market and, and, and psychological challenges, right? So we, we launched the beta version of Singularity Net platform in, in February, I mean, using eth Ethereum as, as, as the blockchain layer. And this lets you have different AI agents, you know, r running in the network where things like payment and I identity management and reputation rating and so on use the blockchain, but passing large bunches of data around or the AI processing it, it, it itself is all, is all done off chain and you can you can set up sort of persistent channels between different AI agents that, that will will send information back and forth efficiently and can la can last last quite a long time so then then i mean that there are still a lot of technical things we would like to do that neither ethereum nor other current any other current blockchain will do now so for what we're doing now ethereum is actually great it's it's fine i mean we have a set of AI agents that they live for a while, they maintain relationships with customers or with other AIs for a while. AIs can outsource to other AIs and they can cooperate on things. And as long as these relations are somewhat persistent between agents, then, then you're cool. Now, in the long-term vision that, that we've had for a long time, we want it to be more like dynamically assembled microservices where you, you would have one AI that say summarizing a document, mm -hmm. but if, if, it, if it encounters some complex medical terminology, you know, in the, in the course of summarizing that document, which might take a tenth of a second, it could put out a request and find, you know, 10 other agents that know about medicine. One of them could create a new agent to answer questions about medicine in the exact context of that document. And then it would integrate all that knowledge in, into its answer, right? So if you if you really want 
microservices where new relations between agents are being established rapidly in the course of answering like a query in, in real time. I mean, our platform won't do that right, right now. And the only way we could figure out to do that now would be to just do pretty much everything off chain, which kind of obviates the point of, of using a blockchain in, in, in the first place. But that, that doesn't mean these are like insuperable obstacles though. I mean, they're just computer science and, and software engineering challenges which, which, which are being worked on so that, that's the technical side but the the adoption side is is different and is in some ways even subtler because you getting developers to put their ai code into this decentralized platform is is one thing and in many cases they'll do it for the cool value of it getting users of ai which in many cases are corporations large and small many of whom are not that technically savvy but they need ai to drive their business <laughs> getting them to use this sort of weird decentralized blockchain-based network, it's an interesting marketing challenge. In some ways, it's, it's eased by the popularity of blockchain because the fact that you're using blockchain is perceived as, as cool. And also, a big company in, say, pharmaceuticals or automotive industry, they don't necessarily want to rely on Google, Facebook, or Microsoft for all their needs all their needs either so the fact that it's owned by everyone and no one can be perceived as a plus yeah. on the other hand they have to think it's going to be scalable and and reliable and, and secure and solve all their problems so there, there's sort of there's that marketing issue which is being confronted by the whole blockchain se sector really is getting getting taken seriously but you address sort of the democratization of it as well and sort of it's quite egalitarian so you were <laughs> nodding your head and when Ben was speaking about some of the, the significant challenges. So from your perspective though, mm -hmm. is there, are there more things that need to be done, can be done, should be done? <laughs> there's definitely very I mean, you guys will be put yeah. out of business, I suppose, if there's not more to be done. Yeah, and there's definitely very significant technical challenges still to be solved. Um, scalability is probably the biggest one. Um, like there is right now there's just not enough space on blockchains to make these like privacy preserving cryptographic data markets work for more than a few hundred thousand people if people started really using them mm -hmm. and that's something that's being actively worked on and there is like, these all of these different like layer one layer two scaling solutions you'll hear about at these uh, crypto conferences so it's definitely uh, on its way to uh, improving uh, quite a bit um, privacy is another one, and I expect privacy to be mostly improved by this uh, fusion of blockchains with other cryptographic technologies that provide all of these really magical properties of being able to like, encrypt data and make proofs that work only if you have like, uh, pieces of data that satisfy particular mm -hmm. functions. So you can use them as building blocks to build things with pretty much whatever properties you want. Um, there's Problems around like user level security is another big one. So like this idea of um, using your own data becomes um, less credible if just everyone is using them on phones that are incredibly insecure and, and can get really easily hacked if like someone goes into T-Mobile and like switches your fo uh, your phone number, which yeah. just happens mm -hmm. to like five of my friends literally three days ago. <laughs> <laughs> so. There's definitely challenges in this space, but in, uh, very recently there's been a lot of like, very good work from different parts in the blockchain space to address each one of them, so I'm optimistic. I'd say yeah. homomorphic encryption is another example which is sort of implied by some of the comments Vitalik was making earlier. So if you want to do something like Ocean Protocol is doing, which is one of the projects that doing something as he was alluding to, lets you keep a bunch of data on your own server. AI nodes in, in Docker containers or something can visit that server and, and, and crunch the data and even get, get results for you. But the data never, le never leaves your server. But if, if you're really paranoid and don't want that container, that AI agent, to even see all the details of your data. In theory, like there's math there, you can homomorphically encrypt that data in a way that lets the AI see only certain properties of the data instead of seeing all the data. Numeri is based on that for, for time series prediction, for example. There's a bunch of blockchain startups working on that in the medical space where, so we could crunch your medical data to see only the properties of that data that are needed to tell if you are, are susceptible to some disease or something, but without seeing enough of your medical data to uniquely identify you. This is really nice. The, the thing is that d actually doing 
applying like a large neural net model on homomorphically encrypted version of your genomic data or something would be way, way too slow to do right now. I mean, there's no fundamental reason why it has to be, but there's mm -hmm. just a lot of math and computer science work to be done to, to sort of cash out this, this vision that the aspects of the data that a certain mm -hmm. AI needs to see are the only ones that, it, that, it, that it's going to see. But I think, I mean, all this will come. Like, Is China I, doing that with x-rays? China? Yeah. Well, why, the, why would the, they care about that? The China is really taking x-rays of, of, you know, their their citizens and yeah. releasing that information to find, um, you know, anomalies and, and you know. Well, that's true, but, but I don't believe they're homomorphically encrypting the x-rays. No, I mean, of course not. I mean, the, be the beauty of being China is they can just <laughs> collect everyone's data and most people there aren't too worried about it because the, cult the culture is a bit different. And they can, they're using blockchain quite effectively there, largely to, to reduce corruption across different levels of government. But they, but they, they don't have a big issue with, with keeping their own data private from, from the government there, which, which simplifies things. But I, th I think ultimately we can progress better by developing the same technologies in, in, a, in a decentralized way that gives more agency to the individuals and the organizations at, at different scales. But, but to do things in a way that's decentralized does require more computer science effort that, that still has to be done. Well, um, we wanted to leave some time for questions from the floor because it's a pretty extraordinary opportunity to have these two individuals here at the same time um, in the same space. Um, so I don't know if you guys have a roaming mic that you want to use or if you want to just stand up and pose your question, please. I think, ma'am, I think uh, you're going to have to come a little bit cl um, closer or someone take this mic and... Excuse me. Sorry. Yeah, it's, yeah, too, it's, it's too quiet for the live stream especially. Okay. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nikki Ram. I have a question for Vitalik. Um, I understand that uh, obviously scalability and energy is a big issue, especially. Um, so I was thinking, I w my question is, what do you think about companies like Holochain that they propose that they solve those sort of issues? I don't know anything about Holochain, unfortunately. Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, how would you propose in in does Ethereum in the future <laughs> want to solve something like Summarize that? Summarize yeah, future I mean, plans for Ethereum scaling uh, in, in five words or in less. Terms of <laughs> like yeah. I mean, in terms of energy efficiency <laughs> issues, like our proof of stake is basically uh, the main thing we're doing to try to cut that down in the short term. So we've ha we have uh, test nets of uh, a pr proof of stake chains uh, running for uh, the last few weeks now. So, uh, so that's actually coming uh, very close to launching. And when that happens, uh, we won't uh, need all of this uh, extremely energy efficient, uh, mi inefficient mining anymore. And we can re reduce the you know, energy consumption of the network by a really huge amount. And then for scalability is sharding. Uh, so s and of redesigning the blockchain so that every computer in the network only needs to verify a small portion of all the transactions is something that's been r really actively worked on as well. And it's like a bit behind proof of stake, but not that far behind. You know, I have a question for you, which, mm -hmm. which is in, in, in working on, on sharding, for example, or proof of stake, how much are you slowed down by the need to have backwards compatibility with the currently working Ethereum network, as, as opposed to if you were just like implementing something new that you just thought of today? I mean, the approach that we're taking kind of is close to creating something new. Like it's creating a, a, a new chain with like uh, all of the different improved bits kind of coming at the same mm -hmm. time. And the idea is that the existing chain will kind of be folded into the new system. I see. Um, cool. So, yeah, it's like actually uh, n uh, not that high a cost. Like it would have definitely been five times more difficult if we tried to kind of incrementally redesign the system piece by piece. And then we would have had to like keep some core in the, mid um, in the middle that would have just stayed working under the old rules and so forth. Then it would have led to a much more complex system. Great. It's a less technical question, and it's mm -hmm. more, in your lives, did philosophy or math come first? Which one came first? <laughs> Both of you. Go ahead, Ben. Me? 
me? Well, <laughs> I guess, literally speaking, probably math came first. Like I, I learned to do math before I knew what what philosophy was. I, I probably learned arithmetic when I was two years old or something. But then my my mother was doing graduate work in Chinese history and philosophy when I was six to eight years old. So I, re I read a whole bunch of, of philosophy then. But yeah, I would say in my own generation, AI was not popular, right? I mean, I learned about AI from Star Trek and, and Space 1999 with these cheesy robots in them. But in my generation, to get into AI, you really had to start thinking things through from scratch, like how does the mind work? What is intelligence? And both math, philosophy, biology, linguistics, neuroscience, every, everything, Everything plays in, and I came to computer science much later when I was like 13 or 14, because before that you couldn't get a computer to play with. And but that was the 1970s. This was like before this dude was born. So. Yeah, I mean, for me, when I was much younger, I mean, math was definitely a big part of my life. Whereas philosophy it was more like reading these fun books about whether or not you should push the fat guy off a cliff so he just, so he lands on a railroad and stops the trolley from killing five other people, which is like really interesting, but it was fairly academic. It depends if you can video him falling or not. Right? Yeah, 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 which is like interesting but more kind of academic until much more recently and the blockchain space is really interesting in how it kind of weaves together all those different uh, all of those different parts and takes from all of them um there's a question do you want to hand the microphone off? thank you so a question for uh, vitalik uh, so do you think you know that in your long-term vision you are going to use uh, artificial intelligence to govern ethereum uh, and the protocol probably not <laughs> So why? I mean, my view on like AI and blockchains is that I think AI makes much more sense at the edge of blockchain systems rather than at the center of them. And the problem with putting it at the center, right, is that we're basically putting these algorithms in the middle of things and giving a, a, of pieces of basic infrastructure and giving them huge power over them when we have no like no idea how these algorithms work. The designers might have some idea, but not 100% of an idea, and then it ends up being like, either it's completely opaque to all of the users of the system, or often if it's not opaque, you can do adversarial learning on it, and, and anyone can figure out how to cheat the system. So like AIs and kind of quote algorithms running things basic often has this problem that you have to like, basically choose between them being opaque versus them being really exploitable if they're at the center. Whereas if you, instead of talking about algorithms, you talk about blockchains and mechanisms, so tools for different agents to cooperate with each other, then at least the hope is that you don't have um, a lot of those same issues. And I mean, the AIs can participate in the mechanisms. I mean, I, I would say that before too long, it will be, de facto AIs that are, are, are governing whatever are the dominant blockchain networks, quite, quite possibly Ethereum. I mean, simply because if, if AIs are doing most of the business and AI-run DAOs are the next Google, Facebook, and Baidu and, and whatnot, it's going to be AIs that are owning the, the tokens and that are, that are doing the voting. And who can, I mean, is it really going to be feasible to put a, an are you a human test every time you, you, you vote? I, 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 so I, I doubt it. But with the, with the AI technology we have right now at this exact moment, however, yeah, it, it, it's got to be humans because the AIs don't have an understanding of, of, of context and they're, they're just being proxies for some human in, in a very specific way anyway. So, I mean, my, you, you have to, if you build in predicted advancement in, in AI, my own answer would be quite different. But, but that, that, that's good. We had to disagree on something. Otherwise, it's mm. not a real panel. It's not right? a real panel. Mm. We have time for a couple more questions. And depending on these fine gentlemen up here, how quickly they answer, maybe we can get a few more in. Yes, sir. False quote. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, false. <laughs> awesome. One word answers. Um, One answer. You can say it twice. Um, so I'm still going to ask a question. Uh, so, um, before I, I actually ask a question, uh, AI is probabilistic and you know, crypto is deterministic and I think we want to bring crypto into AI, not the other way around. I'm hoping that you guys agree with that. Now, what is, uh, um, 
a, a question to Ben. What is it being done uh, globally to truly bring decentralization into AI today, given that uh, a lot of centralized forces, they're actually driving AI a lot uh, more uh, than decentralized. So what is it being done to actually counter that force? Yeah, so th there's a number of things. I, I think we, we have the plumbing now for decentralized AI by projects like SingularityNet, which is my own project, Ocean Protocol, and actually dozens of other projects out there, mostly building on the Ethereum network. And, and so we, we have the plumbing now to do decentralized AI. And uh, as, as you are aware, since you are the, the co-founder of it, we, we've created a, an industry alliance called DIA, Decentralized AI Alliance, which is sort of bringing together around 50 and, and growing different projects using AI and and blockchain together and interoperability being the next challenge there. So it's it's a network of AI networks on blockchain. So there's of course more work to do, but if we take for granted that sort of the the decentralized AI plumbing problem is now solved. I mean as as of this as of this year with things like Singularity and Ocean actually shipping, you know, working reasonably scalable betas, then then it's adoption, right? And that comes down to you know, usability. Can we make these as slick to use as, as TensorFlow or, or all of Google's very various tools? And then it, it comes down to marketing among, among users and developers, no, none of which are trivial problems, however. And a lot of us would rather work on the nitty gritty algorithmic and, and computer science problems than on marketing and, 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 and community building. And these big companies that you mentioned are, are very, very good at, 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 at these aspects of marketing to users and to, and to developers also. So I think we are moving on to a phase now where the question isn't like, can decentralized AI work or is it way, way ahead of its time or something? The question is now, can we get people to actually develop for it and use it when there's insane amounts of money being spent making centralized approaches really appealing and really easy? Uh, whoever's running the shot clock here keeps giving me more time. So there's a little basketball reference, you know, for the Toronto Raptors uh, fans. Tufi has hacked into the laws of <laughs> it's physics. It's perfect. He, okay. He, he has a so way of doing that. That's actually very helpful yeah. because I think that there are more and more questions that seem to be popping up as this conversation continues to go. But you have the microphone, sir, so you get to go first. Um, Vitalik, you've mentioned in the past that decentralized finance will be one of the early applications of Ethereum mm -hmm. and one of the easiest ones, perhaps, to begin with. Then also throughout uh, the talks today, people have mentioned that AI was applied to markets quite early on. Mm -hmm. Now, knowing this, what do you think the first AI applications will be towards decentralized finance? Arbitrage bots. Yes, yes. So uh, the spreads between exchanges are quite, quite high. That you think will be the first thing to go? I mean, the, the spread between exchanges is much lower than it was years ago because the arbitrage bots have gotten better already, right? And they have been quite fast. Like I remember when uh, Uniswap launched, there started to be automated arbitrage happening f for it, like pretty much within days. And that was a fundamentally new type of exchange that got pushed out. So, you know, and there's definitely, a, like, when there's incentives, there is definitely smart people that will swarm around them. Hmm. I think I saw a hand over here. Sir, do you mind coming and let's make this a true democracy and hang the, hand the microphones over. Thank you. Um, my question is related to Tesla network. Um, ben, do you see there's any benefit to have a decentralized uh, AI on the Tesla network? And the question for uh, Vitalik is that, uh, so far, Tesla network have never mentioned anything about blockchain. If you get a chance to talk to Elon Musk, what kind of advice would you <laughs> give to him? Is that a subtle uh, addressing of the Twitter battle you two had? I'm not sure, but uh, go ahead, Vitalik. I mean, I don't, I don't know, right? Like, not everything has like blockchain applications that immediately make a lot of sense. And if um, Elon came and asked, like, what's one way that I can know we can like integrate Ethereum to make it the Tesla car is better right now. I'm not sure I'd be able to say too much. Um, in a, in the longer term, when we have like thing like things like 
blockchain based um, markets and what and like what for you know, different like infrastructure and what and uh, markets for data and a lot of these applications get integrated into supply chains and so forth there are pr probably will be more things but it's not necessarily the ideal kind of first use case to start to start trying to push out to millions of people with well i could i could tell you one application that would be very critical as you move toward autonomous driving i mean you have many many different companies doing autonomous driving with with computer vision systems and one issue you have is that given the deep neural net systems used for computer vision now these systems stick overly close to their training data. So if something bad happens in the road, which is a situation that wasn't represented in, in, the, in the training data, the car won't recognize it. And then, it, you know, it'll, it'll run over that zoo animal or, you know, it, 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 it will react, it will react in, in, in a bad way to the truck that veered across the median of the highway or something. So on the other hand, what's happening is each company is keeping its own data from its own cars because that data is valuable to creating their, their autonomous system, right? So what, what you should have happen is, okay, if, if different companies making auton fleets of autonomous cars need to keep some of their data private to tune their cars better, let them keep it private, but they should be sharing data that's critical to human safety among all the different companies making self-driving cars. And this sort of thing where you're sharing certain aspects of data and you're keeping private other aspects of data. I mean, in, in, in principle, this is something that blockchain with homomorphic encryption, multi-party computation, various of these computer science tricks should be really useful for. And ag again, though, the core application I see there is for sharing of data and processing among multiple entities that don't necessarily fully trust each other, meaning competing self-driving car companies. Like solely within Tesla's own network it's not obvious there's there's a huge immediate application but the application i described would be would be highly valuable and probably elon musk would get that and would be interested in it but i, I would say everyone's got everyone who's trying to build amazing new technology has a long a long list of problems to solve and then it, it, it's a matter of when when does something jump jump to the to the top of the list right but per, perhaps Elon is is watching this uh, live stream right 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 now, and your question will start a new collaboration among the three of us. All right, we know we really are coming down to the time crunch. I have time for two more questions. Yes, sir. This is for both uh, Ben and Vitalik. You uh, you brought up several points that, uh, on one hand, advocate decentralization, but also at the same time seems to create some inconsistency. One is. Uh, as you actually provide data on a, a publicly open decentralized system through uh, sophisticated algorithms, we can at times predict who these people are. So some of the anonymity vanishes with time. And secondly, the idea that uh, going Ben, the, the idea that AI can help uh, sort of uh, move away from the uh, dominance of a few players, but the reality is there's only a few players who have the intellectual capital to build these systems and the rest of us who may not, may, may not quite be in the same position to be able to control that. I wanted to get your opinions on those two. Well, so first of all, I would say decentralization is not one system of organization. I mean, it's the opposite of having an oligopoly or, or a dictator, right? So just as in politics, you say there's no dictator or no collection of oligarchs ruling everything, that doesn't tell you what the alternate system is. It, it just opens things up. So, I mean, decentralization is like that, and that's the beauty of the flexibility of, of smart contract-based frameworks. I mean, you can, you can script many, many modes of, of, of organization. So some decentralized systems of organizing AIs and peoples would be horrible and, and, and much worse than the current centralized systems, and the best of them, I think, would be much better than, than the current centralized systems. And in terms of the supposed concentration of AI talent and expertise, I mean, this this is a social organization phenomenon, right? Because the, I mean, why are, why are AI PhDs going to work for these big, big, big companies in, instead of doing something else? I mean, the expertise isn't in the CEO or the, or the board of the company. The expertise is in AI programmers who are choos choosing to, to work for them instead of doing, doing something else. So I, I think, while it's not quite the same thing, I often hold out Linux as an interesting example of how something extremely influential 
in the whole world software technology infrastructure was developed outside the hegemony of large corporations. And I'm old enough to remember when people said that would be impossible, open source could never work because people fundamentally you know, ne ne need to be developing stuff that, that, that they own. So the thing is open source isn't good enough when you're dealing with things that need huge amounts of processing power and huge amounts of data, because even if the code is open source, whoever has the big hard drive and all the processors still has the autocratic control. So you need to go a little bit beyond open source and you need decentralized control of data storage and, and processing. And if you throw into that decentralized modes of incentivization, which is what comes with, with tokenomic infrastructures, then I think you have the key that can allow a different sort of socio-economic organization to self-organize along, along with these new technologies which can break up this hegemony which seems strange now but uh, again it seemed strange at one point that Google and Facebook and so on could become so big and like Wang and Honeywell and so forth would, would, would become footnotes in history so I, I, I think I think it's not at all outlandish to envision that in, in, in five or ten years DAOs and decentralized networks, you know, leveraging contributions of developers all over the world and AIs running all over the world can, can be much, much bigger than these centralized corporations now. That was Ben keeping it brief, by the way. So good job. Yeah. Vitalik, you're going to get the last word here. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, regarding the other point, it's definitely easy to underestimate the, the power of math and cryptography. Like, it definitely is possible to create a system which, um, for example, allows uh, allows you to have something like a, something like a personalized news feed where your own data stays entirely 100% on your local computer and there's calcul computations being done on the local computer. Like, it's also possible to have systems where data from your own activity contributes to the result of some model where it actually is the case that there's only a few bits of data leaving your computer and those bits uh, are you know, designed in, su in such a way that it doesn't uh, significantly de-anonymize you. So there's definitely a lot of things that can be done and even if it's not perfect, it's still a very, can e very easily be a large improvement on the status quo. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know that some of you had questions for them. They will be hanging around and you have a more of an opportunity to engage with them one-on-one. Um, -on -one. But I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you, both Ben and Vitalik, for your candor, uh, honesty. It's a um, pretty extraordinary group of people to talk in front of. And so they, um, everybody benefited from hearing from you. Thank you. Big thank you to the Crypto Chicks for hosting this. And uh, you have a big party tonight. It's a party like a coder. Um, have a lot of fun and uh, enjoy the next seminar, which I be believe will be starting in just a few short minutes. Thank you.